Hello, my name is Natalia Wagemans. I'm head of the Nestle Nutrition Institute, and I'm very glad to welcome you to the 95th, but the first virtual global Nestle Nutrition Institute workshop, Building Future Health and Well-Being of Thriving Toddlers and Young Children. The Nestle Nutrition Institute is a non-for-profit association in Switzerland with the goal to advance science of nutrition. We drive progress by bringing the breakthrough research conducted by Nestle and the world-renowned experts supporting the global scientific community and empowering healthcare professionals in their practice. Through science, we bring nutrition to life. Our vision is to bring nutrition science to life through the people who live it. And this is very important to fulfill our mission, because what we want, we want to advance the science of nutrition, build the understanding today to shape the innovation of tomorrow. Nestle Nutrition Institute is the trusted education partner to healthcare community. Our scientific workshops are the cornerstone of our commitment to the healthcare and nutrition communities around the globe. Since 1981, we have been committed to supporting the academic community, working together to stimulate discussions and build knowledge. During these years, we have brought to scientific discussion various topics in area of nutrition, from the importance of nutrition to the first thousand days, to the role of nutrition in frailty elderly population, from sport nutrition to a microbiome and mucosal immunity. The iconic blue books have become the flagship of the workshops and highly appreciated by the academic healthcare and research community around the world. The 95th Nestle Nutrition Institute workshop is dedicated to the theme of building future health and well-being of thriving toddlers and young children. Why suddenly are we talking about toddlers? Is there a specific concern related to this age group? Toddlers refers to a time of great development between infancy and preschool, which encompasses key milestones important to child and parents. Toddlerhood is the period which represents striking changes on rapid cognitive, social, emotional, and physical development. Development during the toddler years is highly sensitive to environmental factors. Thus, this time presents a critical period to ensure toddlers are provided with the right building blocks for their motor, social, and cognitive development. Nutrition is one of the critical environmental factors. Nutrition deficiencies in this period can have an immediate and also long-term impact on development with consequences that extend over the entire life course and may also affect the next generation. For example, in 2019, more than 21% or more than one in five children under the age of five worldwide had stunted growth. Stunted children fail to reach their physical and cognitive potential. In addition, children who suffer from growth retardation as a result of poor diets and or recurrent infections tend to have a greater risk of suffering illness and death. Micronutrient deficiencies, which very often occurs in early life, reflect poor quality of diet or food insecurity. It could be less obvious as it is not necessary impact growth. However, it may influence immunity and cognitive development. The other point on feeding behavior is could be a possible link between nutrition and development. Responsive feeding is an important mechanism which helps the child to learn how to regulate hunger and satiety, given that at many places around the world children are growing in the environment which is favorable to overweight and obesity. The 95th Nestle Nutrition Institute workshop program will give you a comprehensive overview on the challenges and opportunities which toddler and young children may have in life. The first session of the workshop, chaired by Professor Atul Singal, will bring light on the challenges in nutrition in toddlers and young children. 
Professor Atul Singal is Great Ormond Street Hospital Children Charity Professor of Pediatrics, Nutrition University of College of London, Institute of Child Health, and Honorary Consultant Pediatrician at the Great Ormond Street Hospital. He graduated in medicine from the Royal Free Hospital London in 1986 and has been a consultant in pediatrics since 1998. Previously, he was the director and deputy director of the Child Nutrition Research Center, UCL Institute of Child Health. He has brought interest in pediatric nutrition, but his current research focuses on the influence of early nutrition for long-term health, the effects of nutritional interventions to reduce long-term cardiovascular risk, and nutritional interventions for obesity. Session two, led by Professor Maureen Black, will be focusing on milestones in advancing from infancy to toddlerhood through food. Maureen Black is professor in the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Distinguished Fellow RTI International. She is John Skoll and Mary Louise Skoll Endowed Professor, Principal Investigator, NIH Awards, Maureen Black had a lot of randomized clinical trials on nutrition and physical activity inter interventions, co-investigator on three other NIH-funded projects. Her current interest, prevention of health disparities among young children in low-income communities, intervention research integrating early childhood development and nutrition. And the session three, on Health Behavior and the Developing Brain, chaired by Professor Charles Hillman. Charles Hillman is a professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Community Health in the University of Illinois for 16 years. Different appointments which he holds in the Department of Physiology, the Division of Neuroscience, the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology, and Department of Physiology and Physical Therapy and Movement Rehabilitation Science. Associated Director in the Center for Cognitive and Brain Health in uh, Boston University. Charles Hillman published more than 225 referred journal articles, 13 books, chapters, and co-edited a text entitled Functional Neuroimaging in Exercise and Sports Science. Charles served in 2018 Health and Human Services Physical Activity Guidelines, and he's very active in NIH-funded research. And with this, I'm giving the floor to Professor Atul Singal to start the first session. Please welcome Atul. Welcome to the first session of the symposium. As kindly introduced, my name is Atul Singal, and it's my great pleasure to be the chair of this first session called Challenges in Nutrition in Toddlers and Young Children. We have five excellent short webinars covering broad aspects of nutrition from in the toddler years, from undernutrition to overnutrition, from richer countries to poorer countries, from behavioral science and their large scale studies assessing diet in young children. I hope these lectures that emphasize on nutrition in toddlers is such a critical issue and a foundation for health throughout life and help to convince you and in your own practice that we should be paying close attention to the nutrition of toddlers. And before I give you my presentation, I'd like to remind you that all today's webinar presentations have been pre-recorded. However, all speakers will be available for a live question and answer session, which will start immediately after the last presentation and will last for half an hour. We welcome your comments and questions. Please look at the question and answer widget on this page. If you think of a question for the speakers at any point, just type it in and I'll hold it for discussion at the end of the event. If it happens that not all questions have been answered during the question and answer session, the speakers will record the answers and you'll be able to listen to them. A link will be shared with you after the event. We invite you to revisit the content yourself and share it with your, uh, your colleagues. Thank you very much. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Professor Maureen Black. She's a professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, a distinguished fellow at the RTI in International. She is an endowed professor from the John A. Scholl and Mary Louise Scholl Fellowship. She is a principal investigator in a large 
National Institute of Health grant, Creating Healthy Habits Among Maryland Preschools, a randomized trial of nutrition and physical activity intervention. She's also co-investigated three other NIH funded projects. Her current interests are prevention of health disparities among young children in low-income communities, interventional research integrating early childhood development and nutrition. And her talk is entitled Nutritional Development, Autonomy, Responsive Feeding, and Baby-Led Weaning. Thank you. Um, greetings. Thank you very much uh, for listening to my talk. The title is Toddler Development and Autonomy. Uh, when we think about early child development, um, it ranges, we're going to be focusing on from conception through age eight. That's the first thousand days up to age two, the second thousand days two to five, and the third up to age eight. Children grow during this time and children also develop. And develop. You can see them going from uh, lying prone to running and uh, jumping. During the toddler period from ages 12 months to 36 months, there's a tremendous amount of development. Children go from walking to running. They go from barely learning to say words to saying sentences. They go from being fed to self-feeding, from baby food to the family diet, and from being dependent to independent dressing, toileting, and many, many other things. So it's a tremendous period of development. Children grow during the toddler period, but their growth slows down from infancy. What we have learned is that excess weight gain during toddlerhood stays with them, and it increases children's risk of overweight and obesity throughout life. In the US, almost 14% of children ages two to five are obese. We would expect 5%. So we have two and a half times the number of children who are already uh, overweight or obese rather, and are at risk. So toddlerhood is an ideal time to establish healthy dietary and physical activity habits. How do children learn? Well, there are three primary ways that they learn, by observation and imitation, by exploration, and by play. As you can see in the um, slide, I guess it's on your uh, left, that children can uh, imitate from the second week of life. In this classic study, the examiner sticks out his tongue and the baby sticks out her tongue. So early, early on, children are very, very careful observers and they want to imitate what they have seen. Then there's exploration. Children are fascinated, toddlers especially. They have to touch things. They want to put things in their mouth. They want to figure out how things work. So they explore. And children learn by playing. That's playing what they see. You can see the little girl feeding her doll because that's what she sees. And you can see the child uh, reaching and climbing. So they learned through these three processes. If we look at observation and modeling, um, we see children doing what they see others doing. So here we see a little girl feeding her doll. Toddlers are also de developing what we call autonomy. That means they want to do things themselves. So toddlers will learn to say no, and I do it myself very early on. You can see that the child feeding himself, he wants to do it himself. They also have limited inhibitory control. That means that they're not good at waiting, and when they want something, they want it right now, which can also be dangerous. Toddlers will try to do what they see others doing, even if it's very dangerous. These are data from uh, the US on the prevalence of unintentional deaths um, and by uh, hundred thousands by age. So if you look at two-year-olds, we have a prevalence of unintentional deaths of 9.9. .9. When we look at three-year-olds, it goes down to 6.7.
And then from age four to 15, it's low. It's 3.9 per 100,000. At age 16, it goes up to 11. Why would it go up at age 16? Well, that's the age at which children can drive. So you can see the risk that toddlers have, that they will do things that put them in peril without realizing it. So it's a tremendous drive towards autonomy that uh, young children have. If we want to influence toddler behavior, it's straightforward. We do it at home, their proximal environments, either at home or in childcare. That, so toddlers will model what they see others doing. So if you're interested in feeding, the um, solution would be eat together. And in physical activity, it's play together. So if we remember, toddlers will model what they see others uh, doing. We'll talk a minute about language development. By age three, uh, toddlers can communicate in sentences. They have about 200 words. And the key is that other family members, non-family members can understand them. So you can see in the graph, the tremendous growth that happens in, um, in language and in vocabulary among toddlers. Toddlers learn by book sharing. That means that we use uh, books to engage children in telling stories. Um, and children learn very much from being engaged and having parents who are responsive and encouraging. If we think about feeding, complementary feeding starts at approximately six months. And uh, during this time, this is when uh, children are having uh, foods other than liquid. There's a risk of micronutrient deficiencies because the micronutrients, iron in particular, from their uh, mothers are no longer available. And at this point, children are crawling on the floor and putting objects into their mouths. So there are challenging hygienic practices. So the second six months can be a vulnerable time in terms of illness and, and growth faltering. And at the same time, children are very, very interested in exploring. So we see what complementary feeding uh, can start to look like. And we'll talk a little bit more about complementary feeding. Um, baby led um, weaning is when uh, the complementary feeding involves children feeding themselves. So typically at about six months, when children are ready to advance beyond the liquid diet, both for their nutrient requirements and their physical and oral motor skills are developed. Traditionally, we have uh, spoon-fed purees, as you see on the top. But in the past several years, baby-led weaning has gained popularity. So that's when uh, babies feed themselves, as you see, uh, with softened bite-sized foods. The advantages to baby-led weeding are that there's maybe exposure to a wide variety of foods. Uh, children are involved in direct contact. They're touching the foods. Um, they're exploring multiple textures. And it may be related to self-regulation. They're uh, eating when they're hungry, stopping when they're satiated or full. And it may build some autonomy and feeding skills. But there are potential disadvantages. And the question is, do they get adequate nutrient intake? There's a safety concern related to choking. And, oh, they can make a mess, as you can see in the um, pictures. So there is evidence around baby-led weaning from several uh, reviews. These, have, these reviews either focus exclusively on baby-led weaning, or they compare traditional and uh, baby-led weaning. So what, they, uh, what the reviews tell us is that baby-led weaning typically occurs in the context of a family meal. So that means others are eating as well. Uh, traditional uh, feeding may or, or may not. Uh, Baby-led weaning is associated with self-regulation and, and satiety. And it appears that there's not a difference in the timing of the initiation of complementary feeding between baby-led and traditional feeding. Um, the evidence thus far suggests an adequacy of weight gain. And it also suggests that there's not a difference in, in choking or micronutrient intake. 
but there's not evidence on the long-term impact on nutrient intake or eating patterns. So more needs to be learned about um, uh, baby-led weeding. I would note that it, it's popular, particularly in England, New Zealand, and um, Brazil. Uh, food neophobia is uh, an issue that um, appears during toddlerhood, and you will hear more about food neophobia uh, during the workshop. It's defined as a refusal or a fear to eat unfamiliar food. It's a very normal developmental phase in toddlerhood, and it may protect toddlers against food that could be um, harmful or could be bitter. Uh, neophobia differs from pickiness. Pickiness is defined as specific food preferences and dislikes, regardless of familiarity. Um, you can see the pictures on the right illustrate children um, that could be neophobic and could be picky. In either case, they're refusing or they're protesting the food that's offered. So both of these conditions, neophobia and pickiness, are associated with negative affect um, and can lead to conflict or uh, feeding, feeding problems. I would say that neophobia is typically um, transitional and uh, children, it's a, it's a phase, but it, the, the negative affect can contribute to uh, conflict within families. Um, if we look at um, responsive feeding, it's a bi-directional concept. So what this means, this is how it works, that um, a baby whines, signaling hunger, a mother offers food, the baby opens her mouth, the mother gives a bite, the baby fusses and may look like this, ooh, a protest, and the mother may smile, offer finger food, and what we see then is the baby smile and accept food. So it's a back and forth process that illustrates that the baby's behavior influences the mother and the mother's behavior influences the baby. Of course, mother could be substituted for father, for grandmother, for another caregiver. The, it, the process is the same. It's a back and forth, what's sometimes called serve and return, but this feeding process cannot be evaluated in isolation because one depends on the other. This is a schema of responsive feeding. And um, what you see on the top are the, um, the, the structure of the feeding arrangement. So that includes healthy food and it includes a pleasant setting and some consistencies in terms of um, the, the behavior that's expected. And what you see, then it represents that the, uh, the child signals hunger or satiety, and then the caregiver has a perception of the child. And the caregiver's behavior depends on the perception of the child's size, the child's signals, the child's health, the child's behavior. But you have this back and forth between a caregiver and child. Uh, just to look at the structure a little more, the structure, this, and this is set up by the caregiver. In addition to healthy food, it includes routines, um, consistent timing around the context or expectations, limited distractions, others eating, modeling, and uh, ending the meal based on toddler satiety and a pleasant mood throughout the uh, meal, as you can see in the pictures on the right with multiple family members eating, um, toddlers clearly engaged and feeding themselves at this point. So these are the, some of the references that um, I've used during the uh, talk. These are all available in the volume that is being published, and I thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alison Elridge. She's an expert scientist at dietary intake at the Nestle Research Center in Lausanne, Switzerland. She received a PhD in nutritional sciences from the University of Arizona and is a registered dietitian. She's a, a principal investigator for the Feeding Infants and Toddler Study, a global research project on dietary intakes, lifestyle, and eating behaviors in infants and young children, and has more than 20 years experience leading dietary intake research in the food industry. 
Her current, <coughs> excuse me, her current interests are dietary intake for children, new technologies for dietary assessment, and the name, her, the title of her talk is The Global Landscape of Nutritional Inadequacy in Toddlers. Thank you, Alison. Hello, my name is Alison Eldridge. I'm here from the Nestle Research Center in Lausanne, Switzerland, and many thanks to the organizers for inviting me today to speak about the global landscape of nutrient inadequacies in toddlers and young children. And we're going to look at that by trying to understand the nutritional issues facing children from different perspectives. The first is from international monitoring organizations looking at growth and weight, the big four micronutrients, We'll also look at qualitative sources of information like dietary diversity, feeding frequency, and minimum acceptable diet scores. And finally, we'll look at what we can get from dietary intake studies of individuals from national surveys. So let's start with monitoring young child growth and weight. The international organizations like UNICEF WHO and the World Bank provide wonderful resources to help us understand what are the major issues that are affecting um, toddlers and young children around the world. And what we can see from these uh, colorful maps is the percent of children in this particular case uh, under the age of five who are stunted globally. And stunting affects 21.9% of children around the world. And we can see high uh, stunting in Middle and Eastern Africa, Southern Asia, and parts of Oceania. They also monitor wasting. And here in children under five, the global burden of wasting is 7.3%. And again, we see Southern Asia as one of the highest country, uh, one of the highest regions in the world. The percent to overweight in children under five affects at the moment 5.9% of the population, and this trend has been increasing in recent years. So the purpose of these uh, international organizations is to set policy and also global nutrition targets that you can see on this slide. And here, while we can see improvements since 2012 in the percent of stunting in under five-year-olds, we're still far away from the target set for 2025 of 14.6%. And similarly, in, the, in, that time, in that span of time, we've seen increases in overweight, and we can expect that that has been also continuing to go up, whereas the targets will continue to go down in 2025 and 2030. The international organizations also focus on what we call the big four micronutrient deficiencies. And these are vitamin A, iron, iodine, and zinc. And these have been selected because deficiencies of these micronutrients have catastrophic effects on child growth, cognitive development, and, and development of blindness. So again, they provide very handy maps for us to refer to to look at the percent of children under five with anemia, with vitamin A deficiency, and you can see those on the, on the right hand, uh, sorry, on the left hand side of the graph, um, the darker the color, the higher the percent deficiency. You can see in the top left hand corner, total zinc deficiency, and you can see um, iodine among school aged children, insufficient iodine intake pictured in purple, in the lower left corner of this, uh, of this slide. The international organizations also have created something they call the Hidden Hunger Index, which combines several of the indicators, including stunting, iron deficiency, anemia, and vitamin A deficiency. And we can see alarmingly high, indicated in red, um, hidden hunger, in, in many countries throughout Africa and, and uh, South Asia. On this slide, we, we can move now from the, the, that international monitoring of growth issues and look at qualitative assessments of dietary diversity, feeding frequency, and minimum acceptable diet scores. Dietary diversity is used as a proxy measure for nutrient adequacy, but it's very easy to score. 
So out of eight categories, if, you, if the children achieve a score of five, they are considered to have minimum dietary diversity. And the categories include breast milk, grains, roots, and tubers, legumes and nuts, dairy foods, meats, eggs, vitamin-rich fruits and vegetables, and other fruits and vegetables. The dietary diversity score, and in this case, applies to children who are six months to 24, 23 months old, as does the meal frequency score, which is another way to assess adequacy in this um, vulnerable population. The minimum meal frequencies vary by age and are based on consumption of breast milk or infant formula or other type of um, dairy products, plus two or more solid or semi-solid feeds per day for six to eight month olds, and three or more solid or semi-solid feeds per day for nine to 23 month olds. Those two scores, diet diversity and, um, and uh, diet diversity and uh, minimum meal frequency um, can be used together to calculate a minimum acceptable diet score for 12 to 23 month olds. And I've graphed this one so that we can see the minimum acceptable diet score uh, in different countries around the world. And we see very low scores across much of Africa and about half of the children receiving the minimum acceptable diet in Central and South America. So let's look to see what we can find from dietary intake studies of individuals. These surveys are generally done by national governments or by private um, organizations who funded national surveys or by universities. And I've selected um, a number of them to show some differences in regions around the world. So let's take a look at Brazil, China, Indonesia, the Philippines, US, Mexico, Germany, and Russia. All of these come from publications of data that were available from these different sources. Uh, in terms of macronutrients, we can see uh, some differences by country, but most notably um, in this group of countries, we see uh, the Philippines, 64% of the calories that are coming from the diet of children 24 to 35 months old in the Philippines comes from carbohydrates. And only 23.4% comes from fat. And generally the macronutrients, so fat intake should be at least 30% in the diet. So we see the Philippines has quite a different dietary pattern compared to other um, countries on this list. If we look at fiber intakes, an adequate intake level has been set for young children at 19 grams per day. But if we look at the, um, the average intakes that, have, that, have, that are coming from these different countries, we see two, China and the Philippines, with especially low fiber intakes, much below 19 grams per day. This slide shows vitamin intakes from these different countries and the percent below the estimated average requirement, which would be the amount um, that's consumed in that population and the percent of children who are at risk for insufficient intakes. And I've highlighted in red circles here the countries and the nutrients where we have the highest risk for inadequate intakes. And so we see vitamin A is a, um, a high risk in Indonesia, Philippines, and Russia. We see vitamin C intakes, a high percentage below the estimated average requirement in Indonesia and Russia. And we see um, not all countries have vit report vitamin D, but for the countries that do report vitamin D, a very high percentage of children are inadequate in vitamin D intakes. And lastly, vitamin E we see appears to be a problem primarily in the Philippines compared to the other countries that are in this, uh, in this list. If we look at mineral intakes, we can also highlight uh, minerals that are low in certain countries. And so for countries like China, Indonesia, and the Philippines that are generally not big dairy consuming countries, we see higher inadequacy in calcium. 
We also see higher inadequacy of iron for Indonesia and the Philippines. And there are also countries who are consuming lower amounts of protein. And we see um, a, high, a relatively high inadequate intake of zinc in the Philippines. It's also important to note from this, uh, we, while we see a high inadequate intake in Russia um, for calcium, this is compared to their local RDA, which is a higher value than the estimated average requirement. And so if we compare exact intakes with other countries, we might not see this, this high um, inadequate level of calcium. So interpretation is very important as you're reading these studies. The bottom line is that uh, the, in the information that we get from the WHO and so on are very uh, regional or country, or, or country specific, but this data is very specific about a larger number of nutrients than we can see with some of the international monitoring. So let's uh, summarize. The international monitoring from the WHO, UNICEF, and the World Bank is used to set public health policy and to monitor and analyze country, regional, and global progress against nutrition targets. Many countries are making progress, but child growth issues like stunting still affect approximately a third of children under five in Southern Asia, Central and Eastern Africa, and parts of Oceania. And as we all are aware, overweight is rising in all regions of the world, and this is something that we need to work together to, to slow. The demographic health surveys and surveys like them that are done by USAID and UNICEF are used to assess infant and young child feeding practices. They're simple qualitative diet quality indicators and they show us that 15% of children 12 to 23 months old in Central and Afri country, African countries and less than 30% in South Asian countries meet a minimum ex acceptable diet score. But if we want detailed information about energy and nutrients, we have to use dietary intake survey data. And these identify groups at risk for inadequate or excess intakes of a wide range of nutrients. They provide data on food sources of energy and nutrients, and they help us to assess dietary patterns. And what, we, what we've seen from the data that I've presented today, there are wide ranges and nutrient intakes for two and three year olds from these different countries. Overall, there's a general low intake of fiber and vitamin D, but wide variability in intakes for vitamins A, C, E, calcium, iron, and zinc. And so in conclusion, different data sources inform in different ways about the nutritional issues that are facing young children around the world. Global data, is less, tends to be less data, deep, less detailed than individual data, which is more detailed, but both types of studies are needed. We see that nutrient intakes generally improve with increased diet diversity, but dietary intake studies specifically can help to identify foods and beverages most relevant to alleviate nutrition, nutrient gaps and improve dietary intakes in this vulnerable population. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Professor Mauro Fisberg. He is an Associate Professor, Department of Pediatrics at the Escola Paulista de Medicina, the Federal University of São Paulo. He's a coordinator in Nutrition and Feeding Difficulties Center. A major achievements is Illumini of the World Health Hunger Program, the University Nations University, Illumini Kellogg's Foundation, Partners of the Americas Fellowship, Chair of the ELAND Latin American Study of Nutrition and Health. His current interests are feeding difficulties, children and adolescent behavior and obesity. And he's gonna be talking about toddlers in Brazil, challenges and opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sherman, for the presentation. I would like to thank Professors Maureen Black, Atel Singal, and Professor Charles Hillman and NNI for the invitation to participate in this so important workshop. In these difficult times, I really do expect to receive you all presently as soon as possible in Brazil. First of all, 
I would like to present my disclosure of interests. I have many uh, supports and I'm a member of boards of many industries, but I do not per per permit any kind of interferences in the contents of my presentations. Now, as you know, in many regions of the world, developing countries are facing different stages of nutrition transition. Malnutrition affects individuals, households, and populations. And we need to face all the problems regarding the consequences of a scarcity and also the diseases of plenty. Individually, we have different cycles of life that would be different from prenatal period to the different cycles of life. In the households, we have many different individuals that are affected by different types of malnutrition. As for populations, we have to cope with the problems of the malnutrition, undernutrition, overweight, and obesity in different regions. Some years ago, the World Bank has shown a trend of obesity in many regions of the world. Latin America and the Caribbean, as you see in red, had the worst scenario. Nonetheless, 10 years before the worst scenarios, we reached high numbers of excess weight and other forms of malnutrition very, very early. In a research that was done by our group in a representative household survey of Brazilian children from two to six years old, we seen that in this Nutri Brazil Infancy Study, we could describe a very important trend for precocious excess weight and also hidden hunger with nutritional risk of intake of iron, vitamins, minerals, and especially zinc and calcium. When you see this graphic of anthropometrics, we see that we had almost 5% of our children with morbid obesity, an excess weight reached more than 27% of all children. 11% of them were obese, and these were children below school years. When we discussed the trends in the last surveys from Brazil from 74 to 2009, we could see a very important increase of overweight and obesity in boys and girls. And especially you can see that in girls, 10 years ago, almost 32% of our children were obese. And the average number of children with excess weight reached almost 40%. That is very, very, very boring. That's why we had to understand the nutrition transition in our countries. We have to evaluate the modification and the phenomena that we had behind the nutritional transition in our country, getting a depth portrait of food patterns and eating habits, as well of life modification, lifestyle modifications that we had in the last few years. As you know, Brazil is a big country with many differences and very important socioeconomic differences. The social differences would lead to very important differences on income that could be important to guarantee food access, health access, the importance of having different diseases in different regions, and especially all of them were related to modifications in the environment. Recent modifications in our societies led to modifications also in the women's role. As you, as you know, in different countries, they have multiple tasks. They had advances and setbacks in many societies, but we could see that we had a very important modification of physical spaces for meals and food preparation, and changes in family and personal relationships with reduced and frequency of sharing meals. We had lost our cultural identity in the act of preparation and the recipes because of the globalization of the habits and new customs. What are the current challenges that we could face in Brazil, especially for toddlers feedings? As you know, the situation in, of nutrition in Brazil is characterized by these three pillars. Poverty, poverty resulting from social inequalities, and this would lead to social and food insecurity. Socially vulnerable families had higher rates of violence and discrimination, 
they have an environment that is always not suitable for physical activities. As nutrition, we have very low rates of breastfeeding, despite all the programs to increase it. We had a very important early weaning, and the complementary food that is increased in the last few years are high in sugar, fat, salt, and we are still using whole cow milk without any modification in the first year of life. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we had an increase of poverty. We had an increase in all the social differences in different regions of our important cities, especially from the urban and rural, in the peripheral areas and the central areas of the city. And this led to an increased food insecurity. That's why we had to understand that there are social vulnerable families during this pandemic. They had very important characteristics. First of all, they have an impossibility of social distances, especially in low socioeconomic levels. Children were at home 24 hours a day, and then we had a problem that is very important in our country is the lack of school meals. This could lead to more domestic violence, malnutritional insecurity, and resulting from the unemployment, the socioeconomic crisis, the nutrition outcomes are very difficult to understand. We have to see what's happening now and what we'll have after the pandemic. So the nutrition after the COVID-19 will be other problems that we were still facing before the problem that are malnutrition, hidden hunger, and obesity living together in the same society. So what are the opportunities to enhance toddlers feeding? We have to understand that all the problems in our country as it is in different other situations, must be related to a multidimensional context of the challenge. We have to transform them in opportunities. All of them must promote adequate nutrition to children and must be based on a framework of to modify families, schools, and the obesogenic environments that we still have in our country. Some specific actions that were done in the past or are still being held in our country, but with very discrete results, were programs related to combat malnutrition and hunger, especially in the years 70 and 80s with the Zero Hunger Program, the iron folate fortification of flour that is mandatory since only 2002, with very difficult follow-up on surveillance, and they are not accorded with the promotion of universal healthy eating habits. Brazil National School Feeding Programs is one of the biggest in the world. It is one of the most important initiatives in school feeding, but they are mostly regular. We are not using local foods, and meals are still promoting food for malnutrition. And we just forget that we are in the late stage of the transition on nutrition with excess weight and obesity. So, one of the opportunity windows that we have are the key meals. That's why we could transform breakfast as an opportunity to increase the amount of milk that is very, very low. Dairy programs, uh, dairy products are very low in our society. So we could use milk not only as a source of calcium, but also a vehicle for cereals, for whole grains, and especially we could transform snacks for a more organized and planned meal, we could have some time an organization of these meals and we could transform homes in a more healthy environment. As for the main meals, it is an opportunity for socialization, for limits, and especially to get together family again. We had learned some lessons from the virus, maybe not, but we know that we still can eat with our families. We have advantages of families together, but it depends very much on the socioeconomic level and the socioeconomic crisis. It's very difficult to have some of the possibilities that we have in high classes in the slums or in the outskirts of our cities. Lower classes, as you know, we always have all higher consequences of anything. Thus, we learned that our child, our children, cannot be left alone. They must be evaluated at a routine care service, even in the presence of crisis. That's why we still have the increase of obesity, 
the increase of hidden hunger, of his screen time that we were combating all the time, now it is an ally for us, and we still have sedentarism. We do not know what will last, but we have to understand that our future will start with many possibilities of changing. First of all, we don't know if our nutrition will be more flexitarian, more plant-based, healthier. We have to cope with the idea that not whole home food is healthy, not all packed foods are bad. We have to try to modify the content of sodium, sugar, and fats. We have to increase all the nutrients that are lacking, like fiber, vitamins, and minerals. But we still have to have affordability, pleasure, and responsibility. But we have also to understand why all the programs are not working in our country. We have a lack of continuity and maintenance of resources. We have political changes, all new elections, and we have new old problems. We are still working to solve the problems of infectious disease like dengue, malaria, measles, and all the things, and we have to cope with the new ones. But we, we have to understand that also what works in small scales, that we are very good on it, does not always work in a country of a continental size like Brazil. So the lack of community commitment when we do not see immediate, immediate results are very important for the continuity of our programs. So we have some take home messages for all of you. We could discuss that all the sectors of our society must have some ideas to promote healthy feeding habits in our children. First of all, in schools, we have to transform our schools in a nutritional educational center and not have only nutrition as a day of fruits, a day of vegetables, a day of the Indians, a day of anything like that. Else. We have curricula that must be part of the, the daily, daily program of our schools. We have to promote regular physical activity. We have to have availability of a healthy and adequate meal and snacks, even in public or even in private schools. As for families, families must be very active and participate in children's feeding, cooking with, ch with children and kids and reserve a time for family meal time. We have to provide healthy food and examples for all the society. As for food industry, they must develop strategies to improve quality of food composition. They have to try to use better products, fortification of foods, supplementation, and especially we have to be very clear on open communication and clear and bright communication to the society and all the sectors. And finally, for government, we have to be very transparent. We have to have policies to control and regulate directed marketing to food to children. We have to have safe spaces. We have laws that are not controlled, but we have to promote physical activities. And we have office to reduce inequality in the access of nutritional food. So as the final conclusion of our take home message, we have to have an integrated system involving families, the schools, governments, and for the industry. We have to have a commitment of all sectors that are involved in children's food feeding. We have to effective outputs to reduce children's overweight and obesity, but also to tackle malnutrition. We have to promote healthy eating habits that will impact life course. And also, we have to be prepared previously for health and educational crisis. We have to be prepared to discuss all old diseases that we have together with the new ones and also to be prepared to have both at the same time with all the problems of resources that we still have. So thank you very much. Gracias e muito obrigado. So the final speaker of this session is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Prentice, who's the director 
of the International Nutrition Group at the London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine and MRC Kaniba, The Gambia. He leads a large research team focused on discovery science directed towards developing next generation nutritional interventions in the world's poorest countries, especially those in sub-Saharan Africa. He's over 300 peer-reviewed publications with an H index of 85. He's been on numerous national and international advisory boards and his research has been recognized by a number of national and international science awards. His current interests are relate to iron, infection, anemia, and the role of mother's preconceptual nutrition in modifying the epigenome of her offspring. He'll be talking about growth faltering, underweight, and stunting. Thank you, Andrew. So greetings from the Gambia. Uh, my title today is Growth Faltering, Underweight, and Stunting. And we're going to be considering this, of course, in the time frame of this overall symposium uh, related to toddlers and preschoolers. First, I must show you my disclosures. Uh, I will receive an honorarium for this, and I also have the honor of sitting on the board of the Nestle uh, Nutrition Institute. So, you all know that stunting and underweight are, are key measures of whether a child has had a long-term and medium or short term indeed a deficit in their nutrition. Stunting relates to the longer term deficits, underweight to the shorter term. And these are, are, are very good measures at a population basis. But we don't actually mind whether a child is small or indeed a bit skinny. Um, what we care about is if that has a consequence. The first consequence in a low-income setting that I work in would be that it does predict their likelihood of survival. So that, of course, is, is very, very important. But as we try and get on top of survival and improve that in such countries, then the other consequences really come to the fore. And foremost amongst that would be whether or not it is related to brain development. So... The period we're looking at, toddlers and uh, preschoolers, is really part of a continuum. And I want to start off by stressing that because there's only so much we can do within the toddler and preschool group because we have already had initial insults perhaps before that and there may be other opportunities later. So what we talk about is windows of opportunity to correct poor growth. I start by reminding you that actually the prior generations have a very important effect on the size of the current generation. Now, obviously, there's nothing we can do about that apart from remain patient as countries go through development. We're intensely interested in the importance of both the mother's and the father's nutrition in the period just before they conceive a baby. And we believe this has very long-term and important consequences on how the baby's methylome is, is developed and hence on their later health. Embryonic and fetal life is of course crucially important and I emphasize embryonic there because some very important things happen within the first few hours of sperm meeting egg in terms of the later size of the uh, person or animal. Of course early infancy by which I mean the period of exclusive breastfeeding ideally in the first six months and then later infancy as there is the transition towards weaning foods are super important. And then we come to this period now, toddlers, which I'm defining as one to three years of age and early childhood up to five years of age. Not forgetting that there may be another final window of opportunity for catch up in adolescence and we've written about that and shown some of our data. So here we have some children within the age group we're uh, discussing. They've just finished their bowl of uh, mani nyankatango, which is a nice meal of rice and pounded groundnuts and baobab leaves, which is uh, uh, highly nutritious. So one might ask why they are shorter than would be expected. I want to start by sharing data from uh, an amazing new set of papers that are available in MedArchive here and that have taken data from 69,000 children in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. So at the top here, what you see are, the, these are the KI cohorts, that stands for Knowledge Integration, led by the Gates Foundation. And you can see in the solid lines at the top, the 
that most stunting occurs during the first two years of life. So by the time we've got to the 12 months, which is the beginning of our toddler age group, children have already suffered a very significant deficit compared to the World Health Organization standards. And here I show you then the prevalence of uh, wasting defined as a length for age score less than minus two standard deviations. You can see in Africa, it's above 40% indicated by the red line. South America below 40%, South Asia significantly above 40%. What about wasting? Well, that has this uh, characteristic pattern of children tending to grow very well in the first two to three months of life when fully breastfed, and then starting to show a consistent pattern of wasting after that. The exact level this occurs at differs between Africa, Latin America, and South Asia. And once again, if we look at the prevalence, again with the 40% line there, we find actually that in Africa it's quite a lot lower. In Latin America, there's almost no wasting. And in South Asia, there's a great deal of wasting. So those patterns are quite different by continent. Now, what are the causes of, and uh, there's, there's much to be read in these papers, I'm just going to show you one, which is what are the causes of being low length for age Z score uh, by the time you've reached two years of age. Now, there are many, many causes. You can't read this, so I'm going to show you the top three uh, to discuss those. The first is birth length. If you're born short, you're going to end up short at two years of life. Now, birth length, of course, is affected by mother's height and weight, and we see clearly that the next two variables are mother's height and weight. And in the next slide, we look in a bit more detail as to what happens there. So stratified on the left-hand side by maternal height, uh, in the middle by maternal weight, and on the right-hand side by maternal BMI. And you see the uh, values for LAS and weight for length, Z-score. And the point being is that if you look at the more solid lines, which are the, the tallest mothers or the heaviest mothers or the mothers with the highest BMI, you can see that by the time we reach our toddler age group, uh, the ch there is a very significant difference between those with big, tall, and heavier mums uh, compared to those with smaller mums. Now, the next question would be, can we recover? Can children recover from this early deficit? Here's data from rural Gambia where I work. You'll see that precipitate drop-off uh, between birth and around two years of age. But what you also see, highlighted by the red box, is that spontaneously, without any intervention, there is some recovery, at least in our population. And we believe that occurs when children's immune function has started to get got on top of uh, their uh, infections and uh, they start to thrive better. What about in other populations? There is some indication, apart from in India in the middle here, from the cohort studies that this also happens in other populations. So I think once they've hit the bottom at 24 months, certainly there is hope for some recovery, a message that you might not universally hear. Now, it's not just about size growth. If you look at the dashed and dotted line at the left-hand side going up, the brain and head, of course, we are acutely aware of the need to have good composition to that growth. And I remind you of something you already know, which is that brain growth is very active in young children. And we want to ensure that not only are they growing well, but that their brain and other organs are developing well. Now, in point of fact, if they are growing well, it's highly likely that their brain will be uh, developing as we would hope. So why do children grow so badly? Well, of course, it's partly about poor diets with low dietary diversity, but we need to consider the other variables as well. Um, subclinical viral bacterial protozoal infections, things that don't bring children to clinics, but are nonetheless affecting their growth. Aflatoxin poisoning, the so-called EED, environmental enteric disease that causes a chronic damage to the gut. Persistent low-grade inflammation is something that we find has a very important effect in the environment we work in here. 
So what about nutrition, so-called nutrition sensitive actions that would combat many of those listed on the prior slide? Well, there's one that uh, dominates above all, which is GDP, the gross domestic product of a country, your wealth. And we can see clearly from this that as countries move through the economic transition and gather uh, wealth, then childhood stunting disappears. So that is by far the most important variable. But in the meantime, before we can get to that for all countries, let's see what else we can do. So a child like this, he actually looks in pretty good nutritional status, but would certainly be stunted if measured. And you can see this is clearly not a great habit to be eating a, chewing on an old maize corn that's been lying on the ground for some months by the look of it. So there's been a great deal of interest into wash, water, sanitation and hygiene interventions. And I want to show you uh, data from very important studies that have just been published uh, in the last couple of years. So these are the uh, WASH benefits and SHINE trials. WASH benefits in Kenya and Bangladesh and the SHINE trial from Zimbabwe. And I've first of all plotted the effects of the IYCF interventions, so infant and young child feeding interventions, uh, against the well-known plots of the uh, 54 country DHS data showing the effects of height. So the bottom blue line for each of these studies shows where they were at baseline and the top line is where they were after intervention, and the red arrow gives us a measure of that size. The message here is that IYCF interventions had effects, significant effects, but very modest effects. Next, we ask, what is the effect of the WASH interventions? And here you see no red arrow, because to our great surprise and disappointment, the WASH interventions had absolutely no benefit. And, of course, there's a great deal of thinking going on in the community as to why this was the case. You might say, well, this is a council for despair. We're never going to get these uh, populations to really improve their height. I would argue against that and say what it is instead is a council of patients. We shouldn't be expecting to take children who are the recipients of many generations of deficits to go from where they are now right up to the ideal uh, WHO centiles. What I think instead is that we need to be patient and we need to move up generation by generation. And that when viewed in that way, then actually there's a great deal of hope that we can adjust these growth charts. So let me end by asking the question, do toddlers and preschoolers require special diets? Younger children certainly do. So this graphic here shows in green are the beginning of our toddler group. Against that are the nutrient requirements of the younger age groups. So seven to nine months in red, 10 to 12 months in blue. And you can see in the younger children, they do have some very intense increases in the composition of the diet that is required for optimal growth, so about nutrient density. However, by the time they get to one year or so, then it is my belief that actually they could thrive perfectly well on an adult diet. So in conclusion, what we need to do is to put together all the elements of the nutrition sensitive and the nutrition specific uh, changes in order to get children to grow as we would wish. And mo most importantly of all, as we've several times emphasized, to have the composition of that growth in terms of brain and other organ development going at an optimal rate so that we can uh, further the future human capital of nations such as this. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to um, thank the Nestle Nutrition Institute for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about obesity in toddlers and young children, its causes and consequences of both short and long-term health. And as always, I'm going to start off with the words of Thomas Edison, who said the doctor of the future will no longer treat the human frame of drugs, but rather will cure and prevent disease with nutrition. Now, as you know, when Edison wrote this, the main interest in nutrition was for meeting nutritional requirements. And for much of the world where malnutrition is common, this is still actually the case. 
But in the 21st century, we've gone from problems of nutritional deficiency to nutritional excess. And this is truly a global problem. So if you look at the percentage of children who are already overweight by five years of age, you can see this is something that affects both richer countries and for poorer countries. Now, fortunately, Brazil isn't so bad because only five to 10% of children are already overweight by five years of age. So in this presentation, I'm going to try and answer three important questions. What are the causes of obesity in toddlers and young children? What are its consequences, both for short and long-term health? And finally, briefly, I'm just going to mention what we can do. But before that, I just want to try and answer one very important question. Why is obesity in toddlers, as opposed to over older children, such a major issue? Well, there are two reasons for this. Firstly, it's because of studies such as the early bird study published in 2009, which showed that actually obesity 70 to 90 percent of obesity is already established by the time a child starts school and it simply tracks after that. So preventing obesity in the toddler years is going to be critical for their long-term health and this has been replicated in a large study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018. This showed that children with rapid weight gain between two and six years of age were 1.4 times more likely to become obese as adolescents. This is a study in 51,000 children. And the second reason is that what toddlers eat, in other words, their dietary patterns, is set very early in life and tracks for later eating patterns. And we know these dietary patterns are associated with later obesity. So optimizing nutrition in the toddler age group is going to be critical for prevention of obesity and its consequences throughout life. Okay, so what are the causes of obesity in toddlers and young children? Well, we know at the simplest level, obesity results from energy intake being greater than energy expenditure. This imbalance doesn't have to be very much. A few calories will add up to a huge amount of fat mass. And we know your genes and your environment, uh, and more recently developmental factors, influence energy balance and hence your risk of developing obesity throughout life. Now, developmental factors include how you're fed in infancy, your pattern of growth, and nutrition in the toddler age group. And it's this concept of developmental factors interacting with the genes environment, which gives us a whole new opportunity for the prevention of obesity, the so-called developmental origins of adult disease hypothesis. And I'm going to focus on these three areas individually in turn. So starting off with genes, now there's no doubt that genetic factors make a major contribution to an individual's risk of developing obesity. We know from studies in identical twins that additive genetic factors account for about 40 to 70% of the variability between individuals. We also know from adoption studies that a BMI of a child is more strongly related to both biological parents than to adoptive parents. This means as a child, you're 10 times more likely to become obese if both parents are obese. More recently, we've begun to identify some of these genes that genome-wide studies have identified over 100 loci associated with body mass index, the first being the FTO gene. The problem with genes is that on average, each gene increases body mass index by only 0.1 units and obesity risk by about 10%. And of the 97 known genetic markers for obesity, together they explain only 2.7% of the phenotypical variation in population body mass index. So clearly the environment is going to be critical. And as pointed out by the WHO and numerous public health bodies, obesity is the result of an inadequate behavioral response or biological response to an adverse environment. Now it's important to remember this environment isn't just what the toddler eats. We know there are major biological, commercial and social determinants of health, all of which affect the risk of obesity. And these risk factors all overlap. This is covered beautifully by Professor Sally Davis's report on how to solve child obesity. She's the chief medical officer of the UK. Now what's important about this is that obesity isn't just the result of a lack of willpower. And this is especially important in toddlers who are not responsible for their dietary intakes and also their behaviours, which are often led by the parents. So I'm going to focus particularly on the biological risk factors such as genes, which I've already mentioned, nutrition and developmental factors. Now, these risk factors also interact with the environment. So your risk, your genetic risk of becoming obese is far greater if you grow up in an adverse or a, an obesogenic environment compared to a supportive environment. So that's the big picture or the overall framework. The problem is, as healthcare professionals, we tend to 
have little control over the big picture. So we focus much more on individual risk factors for obesity. And here we need to understand the risk factors for energy balance, starting off with your diet. So what factors in the toddler diet may increase their risk of developing obesity? Now, as you can imagine, measuring diet in toddlers is difficult. Relatively few studies have done this. One study that has looked at this was the Alstabat study published in the, in the 1990s and the early 2000s. This was a follow-up of 14,000 healthy term infants in the Bristol region in the UK. Now, as you'd expect, this showed that total diets are very poor, 5% had no fruit and vegetable intake, and 25% had a minimal intake. There's a huge social pattern gradient, so children whose mothers had a low level of education ate more chocolate, more white bread, chips, diet drinks, and tea. On the other hand, they had less cheese, fish, breakfast cereal, fruit, and fibres. In other words, they had less nutrient-dense food. And so the overall summary of the toddler diet is, as you'd expect, very poor, high fat intake, high sugar intake, not enough fruit and vegetables. But what you might be surprised about is that actually there are relatively few associations between energy, fat and carbohydrate intake and risk of obesity in this age group. And there are numerous systematic reviews that have shown this, including a Cochrane systematic view. And the reason for this is that the energy balance has, doesn't have to be very much. A few kilocalories extra will add up to a large amount of fat mass. And studies find it difficult to measure this imbalance in energy intake versus energy expenditure. Another approach is to look at what factors in the toddler diet have changed over the last 20 to 50 years and coincided with the increase in obesity. Well, if you compare today's toddlers with the toddlers in the 1950s, you'd see actually they have a lower energy intake. And this is consistent with the idea they're not as active as they used to be, for example, not walking to school. Where the energy comes from is also different. They have less bread, potatoes, vegetables, but they have a staggering 25 times increase in sweet intake and 34 times increase in soft drinks and juices. So they're filling up with fats and sugars rather than complex carbohydrates as is recommended. There's also been a huge increase in portion size. For example, the size of pizzas have gone up by 53% and the size of crisps by about 50% over the last 20 years. So the question really is, does this increase in portion size matter? Does it make any difference to these toddlers' risk of developing obesity? Well, we know from many systematic reviews and meta-analyses that larger portions and increased energy dense diets affect both the energy intake increasing it by about 10 to 15%, and also increased body size. This is known as the portion size effect, and something that's seen in both children and in adults. What's interesting is that portion size appears to affect energy intake in five-year-olds, but not in three-year-olds. And this is consistent with the idea that three-year-olds respond to the appetite, while five-year-olds respond Respond to their social cues. Now, this observation was first made uh, over 20 years ago, but it's been confirmed in a recent systematic review by Small. Okay, so are there particular changes in foods in the toddler age groups which increase their risk of developing obesity? Now, I've already mentioned that uh, there's been a huge increase in sugar intake in, in toddlers and young children, and several systematic reviews have now shown consistent associations between high fruit sugar intake and increased risk of developing obesity. Now, as a result, numerous public health bodies, such as WHO, the Public Health England, Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition, and ESPAGAN, European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, have all said that the average intake of free sugars should not exceed 5% of total dietary energy intake. Now this is, uh, sounds easy, but it's actually quite difficult to do. So if you look at a three-year-old child, 5% of energy intake is about 13 grams of sugar, three teaspoons of sugar, and or 170 mils of fruit juice. So something that's not gonna be easy to, to do. Okay, what about the other side of the energy balance equation? Now we know that physical activity is important for health. Does sedentary behavior, for example, too much screen times in front of the television or a computer, insufficient physical activity cause obesity in toddlers and young children? Physical activity is no doubt important for health, for cardiovascular health, for social, cognitive, physical development. But you might be surprised to hear there are actually very few consistent associations between objectively measured physical activity 
or sedentary behavior such as screen time and obesity in toddlers. And again, this is for the same reason. The energy imbalance doesn't have to be very much and it's actually difficult for studies to measure the energy imbalance which increases your risk of developing obesity. Now there's much more consistent, and the Cochrane Systematic Review actually is consistent with this. This is for interventions for prevention of obesity in children based on children naught to five years. This Cochrane Systematic Review said that interventions that focus only on physical activity do not appear to be effective. There's much more consistent evidence for lack of sleep and an increased risk of developing obesity, possibly by effects on appetite. Now, there are seven cohort studies that showed that toddlers that don't get enough sleep are at a higher risk of developing obesity. The problem is, these are all observational, and so it's difficult to cause a causal link between not enough sleep and an increased risk of developing obesity. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about genes, I've mentioned the environment, which is going to be absolutely critical, but what about developmental factors, such as how you're fed in infancy, your pattern of growth, and your nutrition in the toddler age group? Well, we know that nutrition has a role beyond that of meeting nutritional requirements and really matters for long-term health outcomes such as cognitive function, bone health, ectopic disease, and risk of obesity. The developmental origins of adult disease hypothesis based on the concept of programming. The process by which a stimulus insult, such as breastfeeding, applied at a critical window in development, has a long-term of permanent effect on the structure and function of an organism. Your risk of obesity many years later. And there, Strongest evidence for nutritional programming in humans really comes from the effects of breastfeeding reducing the long-term risk of developing obesity. Then nine systematic reviews show that breastfed infants are less risk of developing obesity, 113 studies. If you look at the evidence overall, there's a 20% reduction of obesity risk with breastfeeding, but if you look at the best studies, there's about a 13% lower risk of developing obesity. And this has been confirmed in a systematic review, three systematic reviews of systematic reviews, which have shown a 13% reduction in later obesity with breastfeeding. Now, we don't know the mechanism for this, but one mechanism we put forward many years ago is that the reason that breastfed babies do better is that breast milk is associated with slow growth and relative undernutrition compared to formula milk, the growth acceleration hypothesis. And by growth acceleration, I mean upward crossing in centile for weight or for length as shown here. Now, since we published this hypothesis and now seven systematic views showing that faster growth in infancy increases the risk of developing major obesity, it's been something that's been seen in low-income countries and high-income countries for weight gain and for length gain. The problem is these studies are observational, so again it's difficult to establish a causal link between faster growth and long-term obesity. We now have some randomized controlled trials that confirm this hypothesis. Faster growth in infancy as a result of a high protein intake increases the risk of obesity later in life. And here we have all the data. The first study is in preterm infants. We have two studies in healthy uh, term SGA infants and two studies in healthy term infants. The interventions range from the first few weeks to the first 12 months. The interventions were all in the first year various different outcomes such as blood pressure, insulin, blood pressure, fat mass, and body mass index. The key thing here is that these risk factors affect later risk of developing obesity. The largest of these studies was the EU uh, obesity study, <coughs> excuse me, which showed that high protein intake in the first year of life doubled your risk of excess body fat at six years and increased visceral fat mass as measured by your preperitoneal fat using ultrasound at five years of age. Now, this isn't something that's just confined to, pre to in first year of life. We looked at older children between six months and 36 months of age and found that in 19 out of 24 studies, a high protein intake in infancy was associated with a greater risk of developing obesity with an effect size of about 0.3 SD scores. There was no effect for carbohydrate or for fat mass. What are the practical implications of this sort of data? Well, firstly, parents need to understand that bigger is not all better. And secondly, we know that cow's milk, which is high protein intake, promotes rapid weight gain, but we know it's not recommended in the first 12 months of life, but also should be restricted to less than 500 mils per day in older infants and toddlers. So, talked a little bit about the causes, what about the consequences of obesity in this age group? Now, we know that obesity has many short-term medical problems associated with it. There are many orthopedic problems, problems with hips, joints, slip femoral epiphyses are more common in children who are obese, problems with sleep, 
liver disease, high cholesterol concentration, and respiratory disease. For example, asthma is worse in children who are obese. Huge number of psychological issues, poor self-esteem, depression, bullying, leading to a poor quality of life, <coughs> excuse me, and a poor academic achievement. But I think the long-term effects of obesity that turn out to be the most important, a systematic view of 23 studies have shown that children who are obese are five times more likely to become obese adults. But it's not just obesity. Each one unit increase in childhood body mass index increases the risk of coronary heart disease by 8%, the risk of type 2 diabetes by 20%, and cancer by 20%. So huge implications of childhood obesity into adult life. So, what can we do? Well, here I'm just going to mention the, the two clear messages. Prevention to start early, especially in the toddler age group, and education of parents, healthcare professionals, and children is critical for the prevention of obesity. And this is something supported by the Cochrane Systematic Review for the Interventions for Prevention of Obesity in Children. They looked at 16 RCTs, over 6,000 children, largely education-based interventions that showed that diet combined with physical activity can reduce the later risk of developing obesity. So in summary, I hope I've um, convinced you that the answer to this question is nutrition and prevention of obesity in toddlers important, is clearly yes. What are its causes? These are complex, these are biological, economic, social determinants of health. When it comes to biological factors, the genes and the environment and developmental factors are all going to be important, but the environment is the most important. What are its consequences? Huge short-term consequences of being obese as a child, but it's a long-term effect for adult obesity and cardiovascular risk, which I think is particularly important. Not just health, we know from the McKinsey report published in 2014 that obesity has a huge economic burden in the UK and many other countries. We know that obesity costs the UK 47 billion pounds per year, which is secondary only to smoking. And what can we do? Well, I think we really need to understand that optimizing nutrition in the toddler age groups really is a foundation for health throughout life. Thank you very much. And you can get more information from the Infant and Toddler Forum website. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, from wherever you are in the world. Um, welcome to the live question and answer session regarding the, uh, the, the wonderful short presentations that you've heard. Now, my name is Atul Singhal. It's my real pleasure to be your chair for this session. And we already have many, many questions. So I will start straight away and I'll ask each of the participants that you've heard just a few minutes ago to deal with some of the most important questions that we're dealing with. So these aren't going to be all the questions, but the most popular questions that you put forward. So I'm going to kick off by asking Maureen the first question. Um, this is, without economic development, how can we improve nutritional status by nutritional education alone? Hey, thank you uh, very much for that question. Um, let me see, if we're interested in um, promoting economic development or contributing to it, then it starts really very, very early. So it starts with ensuring the uh, nutrition of um, mothers and fathers prior to conception. And you know, when we think about promoting healthy nutrition, we focus on the food that's available. We also focus on the feeding habits, the eating habits that are um, available. And so we try to take advantage of the resources that are there. So we say with children, it starts prior to conception and then continues through the prenatal period and then um, early in life through breastfeeding, which um, one can look at what the economic aspects are of, um, of breastfeeding and they certainly are there and then into the toddler period that we have uh, focused on. So that's time to uh, help children develop healthy habits around the foods that are um, available. There are resources to try and use, um, find local foods that are of limited uh, cost. Um, and those are the kinds of things that we promote in uh, uh, our, our children. It's also the time of building healthy habits so that as uh, children continue to grow, that they have um, healthy foods during meals and are not uh, wooed by uh, junk food or unhealthy foods. So 
starting early on, then as those children grow, it contributes to their ability to learn. And ultimately that contributes to their ability to earn and contribute to human capital. And there's an improvement in economic development. So thank you. Thank you very much. So, so the next question is um, addressed to me and uh, there's two questions very similar. So I'm gonna deal with both of these at the same time. The question is, does high protein consumption in toddlerhood have an effect in metabolic programming predisposing to obesity, just as it happens in infancy? And the second related question is, are there differences regarding the type of milk or protein uh, versus other animal milk on metabolic programming? Well, the answer to both those questions in a, in a short nutshell is, is yes. The, the amount of protein a, that a toddler gets is very strongly correlated with the risk of obesity uh, in later in life. And we think this is related to um, uh, the, the promotion of faster weight gain in toddlerhood, which subsequently programs for uh, an increased risk of obesity. And there's about um, uh, a 30 um, observational studies. The problem is, unlike in infancy, we don't have any randomized controlled trial, trial data in the toddler age group. But I, I had a feeling that, that that sort of data is difficult to get. So the second part of the question is, does the type of protein make any difference? Well, we don't, again, we don't know the answer to that, but the, the more, uh, the, the higher the level of protein, the faster the weight gain in infancy or in toddler years and the higher risk of uh, developing later obesity. So we have some evidence that the amount of uh, cow's milk and particularly cow's milk has faster growth prom promoting effects, possibly via stimulation via GF1. So those questions are, are extremely relevant. Okay, so the next question is um, addressed to Mauro. What, uh, regarding the use of fad diets, the use of fad diets such as low carb, gluten free, are increasingly amongst toddlers. What are the possible consequences of these diets? Mauro, could you answer that one for us? Oh, thank you very much for the question. It's a very interesting one. I, I think children are going in very restrictive diets, especially they are restricting fruit, vegetables, legumes. And especially some of them are restricting milk, some of them are restricting uh, cow's food. And so it's important to see which kind of group foods are they restricting it. And why are they restricting it? It's based on philosophy, it's based on religion, it's based on, on uh, trend, uh, it's based on the education of the fathers. But we usually know that the, the positive uh, habits of restricting some of the, the the foods that we are eating, especially cow's meat, could be different if they are decreasing a lot of foods like dairy food or they are restricting uh, sources for vitamins and minerals, and especially for iron, zinc, copper and other things. So it depends very much on which kind of restriction and which kind of diet that are they having for how long and especially which will be the approach that we have. If their parents are vegetarian or they are vegan, we have to cope with that. And so we have to orientate them in order to try to reduce the consequence of this, these preferences and not based on the fact that is a modism or something that is only a trend. So it's very different from case to case and the consequence of that will be different for the timing of the restriction and which will be the amount of restriction and which type of food groups they are restricting. Thank you, that's um, uh, lovely. So um, uh, one question for you, Alison. Um, thanks for your nice presentation, that's great. Um, is that iron deficiency also common in high income countries and more common than actually thought previously? Well, um, there is a range of iron intakes across different countries, that's for sure. And so we do see even in countries that are well nourished overall, iron deficiency in a smaller percentage of children. So it's very important, especially during the complementary feeding period for um, children to get iron fortified infant cereals or other sources of iron in their diet. The particular paper that was mentioned in this question by Van der Merwe um, found that three quarters of young children across Europe were iron replete, meaning they had enough iron. Um, but we did see in that paper, uh, very big ranges from um, quite low iron deficiency um, to quite high iron, de iron deficiency um, in Eastern Europe countries. And so I think this really underscores one of my points from the presentation that having 
dietary intake data from individual countries gives you a perspective that you wouldn't be able to otherwise find. Thank you. Thank you. I know I completely agree. I think it's uh, very important. Uh, one of the key messages is that it's not uh, poor nutrition in toddlers isn't something that's confined to low income countries. And I think it's a really common problem in high income countries as well. So I've got a question for Mauro. Um, what are the uh, nutritional deficiencies common in obese children? That's very important because, uh, as we know, obese children, they are not gourmet children. So they eat a lot but only things that they want. And usually they have a very restrictive patterns, especially from fruits, vegetables, legumes. And usually they do eat a lot of sugars. They had a lot of fat and they had a lot of occasions of meals. So they have many deficiencies that could occur that we call the obese hidden hunger. And this is very important in many countries because they are obese, but also they have deficiencies of some minerals, vitamins, and they, they have some difficulties in just increasing this amount of vitamins and minerals because they do like their kind of food and usually they are not very eager to accept new ones. So the obese children, they, they do have problems if they restrict milk, if they restrict food and vegetables, they probably sometimes they have some restriction on the preparations and the type of preparations that they have. So we know that they are very selective and based on selective and the selectivity, they are picky eaters. So they have to be treated as the most extreme picky eaters, like exactly other kinds of things. So they have a lot of possible deficiencies. And one of them linked to the other question that we have, one of the problems that we are having in our country is the anemia in obese children, especially in those who are not eating meat. So we have a lot of problems that we have to take care of when we are discussing obesity in children. Absolutely, and I, I, I think this highlights the so-called double burden. You get overnutrition and undernutrition in the same populations, and in fact, in the same children. So I think it's a very important question. Now, I've got a question for Maureen, which uh, I think if you know the answer to this, you'll make many mums happy around the world because it's a <laughs> question that many mums actually face. Is um, Developing healthy eating habits in children is sometimes a challenge. So how do you convert a junk food eater into a homemade food eater? And I think that's a really difficult <laughs> question. Oh, yes. I think if we can answer that question, I mean, that would make many people, many, many people happy. <laughs> Um, let's, let's see, you know, if we think how do children learn and what guides children eating is that they learn by their context. They learn by what they see and what they see others doing and by what's available. So if we're thinking about toddlers, there are not many toddlers who are actually going to the store and buying food. Now, are there? No, there aren't. So who is the one who is going to the store and buying the food? It's not the toddler. I tell, I, uh, uh, I tell our, our, our patients that uh, who have children who are either growing not enough or growing too much, that at this point in life, the parent is bigger than the toddler and smarter than the toddler. But every day, always. <laughs> the toddler is gaining on them. Every single day, the toddler's getting bigger, getting smarter, getting bigger, getting smarter. So you have to move into action now. And, and as long as the toddler's not the one going to the store, the parent is, and kids do what they see their parents doing. So starting earlier helps. So if you want your child to have healthy food, what should you be eating? What should you be serving? You should be serving healthy food. And if you want your kid to eat chips, then provide the chips. So it's a, it, it's a strategy and it's not picking on the child that this is the, the special food for you, which is only veggies, while the rest of us are having cookies or chips or whatever, but it's food for the family. And that, that's what we're having. And that extends to other behaviors of children as well. But all over the world, many parents are afraid to be parents. And we say, would you let your child play in the street? Of course not. So you help your child develop a healthy habit by you having a healthy habit and by having a routine of healthy habits and 
believe me, it often works. Absolutely. I think one of the things I learned from your talk is how much they mimic and how much they mimic in terms of what they eat. It's just mm-hmm. quite remarkable, isn't it, really? Mm-hmm. OK, um, now, in the um, uh, absence of um, Prof Prentice, could I ask Alison to, um, perhaps she might be able to address this, but somebody else could interrupt. In Bangladesh, many of the babies of working mothers are cared for by others. Uh, they dislike uh, food um, given by others. Is this food phobia or is this... Uh, um, uh, something else. This is either Alison or Maureen can can try and answer that one. Maureen, do you want to take a stab at this one? Um, if, they, if they just like food that's given by someone else, sometimes yeah. what what uh, what happens is that they're um, whether they are um, feeling uncomfortable because it's a it's a different context, and so they children are very very smart. I showed you pictures of children imitating at at the second day of life. They're very smart and they can detect when there are differences and they learn how to manipulate their parents. And one of the strongest ways that they can manipulate their parents is by not eating. It is powerful, extremely powerful. And that will cause parents or cause caregivers to do something else. And what they, the something else that they do is often not very adaptive in that if a child isn't eating, then sometimes a parent or a caregiver will give them something that they think they will like. And that turns out to be a sugary substance or an unhealthy substance. So whether that is going on, that, that's possible. But children love routine. They, we all like routine. So if a child is not liking something, then I would go back to the modeling that you eat it, you do it, and you continue it in a routine. Great, thank you. I'm gonna choose a nice easy question for myself as uh, uh, it's appeared. It says, is it recommended to take cow's milk before the age of two? And that's a a very important question, but it's relatively straightforward because we have a lot of policies around this question. So most uh, nutrition groups such as Espigan, Seikan and so on, say that we should not have any cow's milk under the age of one, partly because it's got too much protein, but more importantly, it's very low in iron and it causes microscopic blood loss from the gut. So it's associated with iron deficiency. So that's relatively straightforward under the age of one. Between one and two, there's also a recommendation now from many bodies, the Canadian Dietetics, the Espigan and so on, that we should reduce the amount of cow's milk intake. I know the Espigan guidelines, for example, are about a 500 mils, no more than 500 mils a day, partly because it's associated with obesity. So that is a, a relatively easy answer. Okay, now this is one I don't think anybody will know the answer to, but somebody wants to have a stab at this. During the pandemic, should all toddlers get vitamin D and zinc? Anybody want to have a go at that one? Or Yeah, I, I, I can start, I think. Yeah. I, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I think the majority of the researchers in the world, and especially the population, tried to search something in the nutrient area that could prevent or could at least reduce the effects of the, 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 the corona and other things like this. And after a lot of experience and a lot of things, we have seen that we have to be very careful on that. Uh, immunity is something and uh, nutritional uh, uh, offenses are totally different. So we know that we have to be at the top of your defense in order to prevent or at least combat the infection but we do not have any potential magic nutrient that could help or could enhance your defenses during this episode. So the other thing that we have to understand is that we are confusing some things. Uh, We are at home, we are not uh, uh, getting the children out of the home. So the environment will be reduced in light. So the majority of them, probably they had a reduction of some kind of fishes and probably they had a reduction of of sun. So the probability of having a high deficiency of vitamin D is probably very important. And also we had a confusion on zinc. Zinc was related to the uh, hyporexia or the modifications of taste or the modifications of of smelling and is also related to zinc deficiency. 
but we have not seen many differences on the supplementation of zinc in these patients. So we have to be very careful on the specific role of one of the nutrients inside one difficult situation for everyone. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's uh, very easy to look for solutions like vitamin D or zinc or whatever whatever the magic bullet is, but we need the data and we need to do the proper studies to actually yeah. support that. So completely agree. So uh, there's lots and lots of questions on uh, weaning. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask uh, Maureen just to, uh, I'll try and answer some of these. Um, during baby led weaning, is there any specific rules such as start slow uh, with minimal type of food texture, et cetera? And I know it's a very fashionable area of baby led weaning. So um, could you... Yeah, there, there's, um, it is, it is very, very fashionable and popular as I noted in some, um, uh, you know, in some settings. So what is it, what is a, a major concern in baby led weaning? And that's one of uh, choking. So clearly that you would give a child something that um, they, they will not, they will not uh, choke on. The other thing is there are indicators as to whether when a child might be ready to do that. And the, you know, we know that children don't have a, um, oh, there's, there's Andrew. Yeah, Andrew is coming. <laughs> we, we know that children don't have a, a pincer grasp until around 11 or 12 months. So they're using what's called a rake grasp to pick things up. So you give them something that, you know, that they can pick up them, themselves um, and people sometimes will use uh, little pieces of softened like banana or softened meaning uh, steamed soft um, mm -hmm. kind of uh, veggies that they they use the what the recommendations often are is it's a piece of the something in the family meal but it, it should be that they can pick it up that they can get it in their mouth and that they're not going to uh, to choke there are many Thanks. other considerations uh, in the in the uh, book. Uh, we've included references um, around baby led weaning. So useful to consult the published references that are, that are there. Thank you very much. I see Andrew's with us, and uh, you've got the best setting in the background. It looks like a beautiful day, whatever you are. So I'm going to ask a nicer uh, question for you first. There's a uh, the question is: Is any relationship between geographic variation and stunting? That's from Bangladesh. So what's the sort of differences around the world? I think we're trying to answer, ask. You're mute. Hi, everybody. So sorry I dropped off connection problem at this end. Um, any reaction, any relationship between, well, obviously there is, but it's not really geographic. It's more related to, I, I suppose, you know, the, the sort of tropical temperate zone tends to be an area where bugs propagate very well. Um, and so what I uh, pointed out in my talk is that it's not just about food and nutrition. It's about all the other what we call nutrition sense elements that factor into that as well. Um, and including hygiene. I talked about the, the wash interventions. So it is difficult to keep bugs down in tropical settings. It also tends to be those tropical settings that are poorer. So what, at the point I really made uh, was that it's really about economic development. Everybody, I think, in the world aspires to keep their children in a clean and healthy condition. But many people don't have the wherewithal to do that because they're too poor. And once countries come through that economic transition, even without, you know, a ton of specific interventions or education, everything seems to improve because parents have the wherewithal to do better for their children. Sure. Thank you. That's a, a perfect response. Um, I think there's a couple of questions on probiotics and obesity. So I think I'll, I'll take this. The question is, what is the role of some nutritional supplementations and probiotics in the prevention of obesity in children? Now, this is a really, really fashionable area, very trendy, lots and lots of publications in this area. Um, my problem has always been, uh, there's been a lot of associative studies uh, with the probiotics, particularly in infancy, and long later risk of obesity. These have all been associations, but actually just presented a few days ago, the European Society of Endocrinology was a, a f the first, as far as I know, uh, RCT in 100 uh, patients, 100 children, they're roughly six to eight years of age, I think, um, where they gave both groups 
a probi uh, one group a probiotic, the one group a low nutrient, um, low calorie diet. They both got low calorie diets, and the group that had probiotics had a lower. Uh, they lost more weight, so they actually improved better. Now that's a very small hundred patient RCT. I think there's something in this. There's lots of uh, animal evidence that supports this, uh, uh, but we're not there yet in terms of a causal link between probiotics and obesity. But again, a very very uh, important and topical area. So um, now uh, I need to find a question for Alison. <laughs> so, About Alison. red meat consumption. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh. please answer that. Do you want to read it? Because I don't. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> the question is: um, Red meat consumption in adults is associated with heart disease. Any data on meat intake in toddlerhood? Well, we've looked at toddler consumption patterns around the world, and we actually see quite a lot of um, different patterns of intake. Certainly, there are countries where meat intake is very, very rare for one reason or another. Either it's culturally inappropriate for them to consume meat or that they just don't have the money to consume meat. And in other countries where meat is available, it often tends to be consumed, um, not red meat, but say chicken, for example, in the United States is more popular than red meat. So what we really need to do with toddlers is understand the, the context of the consumption in their own country, and then look for opportunities to provide the iron that they need, um, either through fortified products or through increasing intake of, of meat sources or other sources that would provide iron in their diets. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, do you want to answer another question while you're on a roll here? So <laughs> is it necessary to start vitamin D supplementation from birth? Would you be able to answer that? Well, I'm not a medical doctor, so I feel a little out of my element with that okay. question. Okay. Uh, I, 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 the answer is uh, in most countries, in most parts of the world, they recommend vitamin D supplementation for birth because uh, despite the, um, the, the hot climates and sun exposure in places like India, the vitamin D deficiency is extremely common uh, during pregnancy in uh, women of childbearing age because they have no, uh, they have no sun exposure despite the uh, high sunshine. So most countries recommend vitamin D supplementation at birth, especially in the, in the rest feeders. In the formula feeders, you tend to get enough vitamin D in the supplementation but uh, certainly in the UK we recommend it for for, for both okay uh, uh, yes. I, think, yes. I, I think it's important to see that in our country in many countries in South America uh, the supplementation of vitamin A and vitamin D from birth age is very important so it was a very very old uh, measure that it was implemented many years ago and it, Beside all the facts, we know that we have decreased the very important amount of rickets in our countries. So I think it is very important, uh, even if you are not having increased the, the, the amount of less milk or, or formula supplementation. But I think the supplementation from vitamin A and B from the birth age was very important to decrease rickets in our countries. Absolutely, completely agree. So this is um, a definitely a question for Alison. It's food diversity. I noted eight food groups instead of seven. Oh, somebody's moved my question. <laughs> uh, 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 that's gone. Okay. Well, it was the diet diversity yeah. question. Yeah. Yes, that's well, right. Um, there are both the USAID and UNICEF have slightly different um, lists of foods that would go into the diet diversity score. So I, I just gave an illustration that used eight food groups and breast milk was listed as a separate food group because most um, recommendations would be for breastfeeding and we would all agree with this breast is best for the for for babies and so they have breast milk as a separate category and other milks. Um, dairy, other dairy products as a, as a different category as children get over um, older to uh, ensure diet diversity. So they're not incongruent with one another. Thank you. This is my best favorite question. It just says, excellent Dr. Maureen. There's no other question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, it, so I'm going to answer this. No, Dr. Andrew, here you go. You believe that there are unexpected results in the WASH project. Um, what do they have to do with the hypothesis of the microbiome? So the, um, 
the wash results, as I indicated, were extremely disappointing to all of us, uh, of course, very much so for the funding body, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and for the investigators. It's important to say these were fantastic trials done really, really well. So we don't need to redo them. We know this is the answer. Now, I think the problem was that they simply weren't intensive enough. So these children are living in such an unhygienic environment that you, you, the level of intervention needs to be much greater than was achieved in those trials. Um, so where this is going now with the World Health Organization and the investigators in those initial trials is to come up with what we're calling transformative wash, which is the understanding that we've really got to do much more. And my take on this is that what you really need to do is to pipe water into people's homes. That to me is the critical variation. It's been shown that even if you have to only go 20 meters or so to a tap, you use 20 liters per day per person in a household. If you pipe it into the home, you use 60 liters per day. And so there's a vast difference in water usage. And we would infer that that then hygiene and that then comes around to this vicious cycle of gut damage uh, and uh, why children don't grow well. Thank you. So, uh, Nara, I've got this question. Uh, considering the high prevalence of nutritional deficiencies in Brazilian toddlers, do you think that, that specific milks for any age could have a beneficial role? Oh, besides having a very high increase of breastfeeding in our country, we have not reached the necessary amount that, that was recommended by the, the whole organizations. And we are still promoting the, the, the using of whole cow milk in the first year of life. I think we are one of the, the last countries in the world who are using it without and especially it is recommended in some guidelines. So I think it's very important for us to try to combat this kind of approach. And, and based on the fact that we have a lot of deficiencies, especially from vitamins A, D, C, and other vitamins and minerals also, I think the possibility of having a modified meal for an infant formula for at least one or two years of age after the, the, the weaning, I think it's very important. It's a way of combating our deficiencies, and especially because based on the fact that many of our products that are not fortified as they are used in other countries, like juices and milk and other products. So I think it could be very important to have a modified milk, uh, at least for the follow-up continuation of the first year of life. Excellent, thank you. So I'm just gonna uh, deal very briefly with the next question. Is stunting can reduce IQ? What about obesity? Uh, the problem is, is it obesity or is it the micronutrient deficiencies associated with obesity? So there is uh, some observational evidence that obese children have slightly lower IQ, but again, it's impossible to tell uh, which particular nutrients are important. They, uh, uh, obese children, as we discussed earlier, uh, have lots and lots of malnutrition and undernutrition in many different things. So there's lots of questions of weaning. Obviously, this is at all. May, I, may I jump in? Um, uh, perhaps it was uh, phrased clumsily, the question, but it's very important to stress that stunting does not cause yeah. IQ. Right. Stunting I hope so. I hope so. With poor I hope IQ. So. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, <laughs> it's because I'm taller than some others doesn't mean I'm smart by any means at all. There are associations only. Yeah. Or that I'm shorter than others. Yeah. You know, no. Yes, so please, I, it, I have. It, it, <laughs> it is stunting does not cause IQ. Absolutely, and there's a, a that's a, a common problem in nutrition. We assume <laughs> and we always fall fall yeah. down on this. Okay, so um, uh, Maureen, what foods were given as first foods in those practicing baby led weaning? Uh, I, I thank you. I, I, to some extent, answered that uh, question that um, the first foods that are given are ones that are um, soft, that do not uh, cause uh, choking, that the baby can pick up uh, in her hand using a rake grasp because at that point she does not have a pincer grasp yet. So a rake grasp and that she can get to her mouth. And it's often the foods that the family is um, eating, but, but softened. Baby led weeding takes place with a child uh, seated um, 
so that the child can see the family, the family can see the child. So you're taking advantage of the, of the modeling and the imitation that happens and it's part of a, a family meal rather than a separate uh, occasion. Sure. Uh, the most popular question, I've been avoiding it, but I'm going to have to deal with it, is uh, does high protein diet in formula milks affect kidney function in infants? Uh, and the answer is yes. So one of the reasons that cow's milk is dangerous for babies, it has too high osmolar load, it affects kidney function, it causes dehydration. And in fact, formula milks were developed to be safer, better than, uh, than cow's milk. Pr uh, present formulas, they, they, they don't have that same problem. They have a much lower osmotic load, and so they don't have that issue. So just deal with that one very quickly. Um, okay, there's... Um, Right. Um, this is one I think Andrew might be the best person to answer. This is, can improving mother's nutrition during pregnancy help with the problem of childhood obesity? You talked a little bit about maternal size and nutrition affecting stunting, but any thoughts on obesity? Yeah, so there's, there's two aspects to that question. Um, again, I indicated in my talk, we're intensely interested in not so much the uh, nutrition of a mother during pregnancy, but the nutrition of a mother before she conceives. Sure. Um, and I think there we can give some very simple answers and some very complicated ones. Obviously, I won't give the very complicated ones now, except to give a, an indication that they're there. A very simple one is that a, a mum should really try not to be overweight when she conceives, if, if she can possibly get down to at least somewhere near to a reasonably ideal body weight, then the baby is going to, to fare better. So that, that's an easy statement to make. Um, there is, of course, there are, of course, both genetic, as you pointed out, and familial associations between uh, obesity uh, in the mums, in the dads as well, and uh, later life. So it's very hard to pick out whether changing uh, the uh, nutritional intake and status of a mother in pregnancy would be effective. Various trials have uh, been undertaken with the primary outcome of trying to look at birth outcome, do are there fewer uh, premature babies, etc. Um, those have been universally quite difficult to implement in a high income setting because mums aren't terribly good at losing weight or eating less during pregnancy. Uh, and then they, there have been attempts to follow up. My reading... Oh, I think we have lost connection there. So, um, let me ask... Um, so, anybody want to talk about lipids? I think lipids are important in nutritional development. Is that something that... Um, we could deal with? Are lipids important in toddlers? I, I think it's yeah, go ahead. Alison, you, you are the first one. <laughs> no, I, thank you. I just wanted to say lipids are essential in the diets of... of... Everyone. <laughs> Everyone, yeah. Alison, you're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute. I wasn't on mute, but somebody <laughs> muted me. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I was going to say that um, lipids are critical for the development of, of uh, toddler brains and other organs in the body. And so we have specific nutritional requirements for, for lipids uh, for that absolutely for that reason. So I, I think that uh, we wouldn't want to encourage a low fat diet in, um, in toddlers at all, because they need the fats, especially the omega-3 fatty acids for brain development. I, I completely agree. It's one of these confusing things. Low fats may be better in adults, but they're not for toddlers. It's, uh, mm -hmm. Quite. I'm, I'm afraid uh, we've got lots and lots of other questions. We, they keep coming up on my uh, d deck here, but we've had our half an hour. So I hope we've given you some sort of flavor of why toddler nutrition is very important and some of the sort of key public health and uh, clinical issues that are important. So um, I'm just going to ask Natalia to uh, say a few words to wrap up this session. I think this is the first of three sessions. So I hope you've enjoyed the, the talks and the questions. And Natalia, can you um, say a few words for us? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Atul. What a wonderful session. 
sure. great presentations, but discussions and questions are just, just absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much for everyone, for you, dear faculty, and for you participants uh, for asking these great questions. Before I come for, for the small summary, I would like to really ensure you that all questions which we were not able to answer today will be answered later by our faculty and we will place that recording on the National Inversion Institute website. So coming back to the session today, we were talking about uh, nutrition challenges in uh, young children and toddlers. We had great five presentations where we discovered what are the developmental milestones in toddlerhood. And um, it seems it's not that easy to become uh, a great toddler because you have to go through a lot of steps of growth and physical development and learning and cognition and develop your eating behavior. And that's what Maureen explained at her presentation. While Alison moved us to the uh, nutritional intake, and if you look around the world for those countries which have a, a dietary survey, it's very clear that around 50%, maybe even more, are toddlers, they don't get adequate intake of macro and micronutrients. And that's for different reasons, for, for reasons of maybe unavailability, but sometimes it's just for reasons of not enough education and understanding of importance uh, certain uh, nutrients. And definitely the surveys which uh, have to be done in majority of the countries, they can help us to identify the gap and also to, to make uh, improvement in the nutrition of uh, toddlers and young children. After that, uh, Mauro brought us to Brazil with, with, with the beautiful nature, but also with a lot of challenges in, in the young children and toddlerhood. And uh, he explained to us that situation is not that easy in Brazil because there are still some cultural um, habits which are maybe not very favorable for uh, nutrition and toddlers. And uh, Mauro showed us a survey, the la latest survey in Brazil, and it's definitely there is a lot has to be done to make sure that we make a great establishment and foundation for the young children to, to make them a great uh, adult in the future. With Andrew and uh, uh, following Atul's presentation, we took two different parts of uh, growth and actually malnutrition. While Andrew was talking about the nutrition faltering and he explained that, that sometimes, in, especially in the countries which have a challenging um, a nutritional and economical background, uh, young children, they're coming to the toddlerhood already with a lot of establishment in, in the form of wasting and stunting. And this is very important to, to know because um, the right nutrition have to start even, even before, before pregnancy and preconception and, and continues during the uh, all first thousand days. And it should not stop with the first year of uh, a child life. It should continue because toddlerhood coming back to Maureen's presentation gives really a lot of developmental milestones. And Atul uh, explained us the, the situation with overweight and obesity. I told you, uh, usually you talk about the infancy, how the protein, and that's why you had all these questions, how protein can program and, yeah. and what, it, what is right and wrong in the period of infancy. But in your presentation, you greatly showed us that the toddlerhood is also not a period where we can relax as a parent or as a healthcare professionals, we can relax and not be thinking anymore about, about the, um, the right nutrition. In the past decades, nutrition of toddlers became very different. Some nutrients they eat more like carbohydrates and, and fat, some nutrients and, and foods like fruits, vegetables, uh, and fibers in that they, they eat much less. And of course, uh, portion size, physical activity, and, uh, and all programs. And what I like and, and in Atul's presentation, it actually, he gave us the main um, idea of all this session that early nutrition is not just the tool to provide right nutrients. It's much beyond. It's forming, it's forming the child, it's forming the adult with all its uh, health benefits, but also with all behavioral and social and emotional status. So with this, again, I would like to thank all of you and uh, you dear participants, you come tomorrow at two o'clock Central European time, nine o'clock in the morning in Brazil for the next session with Maureen Black about how nutrition can shape our future. Thank you very much and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.